uh, yeah, like I said, I'm self-moderating for this session, so I will not be monitoring the chat or Q&A while I present, but I will make sure to be done 15 or 20 minutes ahead of time. So we got plenty of time for uh, Q&A afterwards. So feel free to put in your questions as we go. And uh, I can always go back in slides and retrace if we need to. So uh, thanks for being here. This is the third of our ADM talks, so the American Development Model. If you attended the first uh, webinar earlier today talking about how we developed the model, we did the big stage overview. Um, we've got the demo or the, the soft rollout website out that I can put a link to later for anybody who missed it. There are strength training pages for each stage. And so what I want to do today is go over uh, how we wrote those pages, the big key points from each one. And then while I was thinking about it too, was first, what's the big key points from each stage as far as strength training goes? Two, with those groups, what are the biggest changes that I tend to make as a strength coach for rowers when I go into a program? So what are like the biggest, uh, yeah, just ch changes that I make with each one. So um, kind of like the, the big rocks or the errors that, that rowers or coaches tend to make for those stages and, and things that I propose doing differently to fit with our long-term athletic development goals for the ADM model. Uh, and then, like I said, Q&A time at the end. So the central questions that we're trying to answer with the ADM overall is who are the athletes, what kind of training is appropriate, when, and in what amounts. So as far as the athlete goes, with each stage, we've tried to define uh, the athlete by motivation as well as chronological, developmental, and training age. Those four factors are really important because it determines how sensitive they are going to be to change. So how effective is our training going to be depends on the athlete's motivation for the training, as well as how biologically, physiologically, and experientially primed they are to receive that kind of training. Then what kind of training is appropriate for athletes of those various different types? When is it appropriate in training for our overall year of rowing or our season of rowing, as well as within the athlete's own individual development? Uh, and then how much training is appropriate for the athlete, which again, depends on these factors. So uh, I often get asked, you know, what's, what's the best kind of squat for rowers or what, what's the best exercise for something? And it always comes back to, okay, let's define the athlete first because there's no one pure training mode or exercise that is going to work for everybody. These are the big promises, the messiest slide of the whole presentation, but I wanted to get a bunch of uh, resources out for how we wrote the strength training content for each stage page. So the National Strength Conditioning Association, which I'm a member of, many strength coaches are, it's the, one of the defaults for the collegiate scene and uh, is becoming more popular for the high school scene as well, has position statements that are free, available to the public and they're super useful. So there's one that is all on long-term youth athletic development. They have one that's just for youth resistance training. Um, and then they, they also have some other ones probably up to uh, resistance training for older adults, helpful for master's athletes. And those are basically eight to 10 page summaries of available research. So each one will have a hundred citations, but each task force kind of like we've done with the ADM boils it down into one condensed paper from that. They also have infographics. So this is a handy, here's their 10 pillars of long-term athletic development. So I want to put that there as a resource for anybody to access. If you have an NSCA certified strength coach in your organization, or if you're friends with one, they can help get you access to NSCA coach, which for my money is the best of the NSCA publications. They do academic research journals like the Journal of Strength Conditioning Research and the Strength Conditioning Research Journal. Um, but NSCA coach is written in a conversational style, not an academic style, but it's still editorially reviewed. And so you still have to have citations and it's, uh, it's more legit than the average blog in terms of going through some editorial filters on its way there. Um, I am a bit biased because my uh, graduate program director is the editor in chief for it. Um, and having been through his writing classes, I know the kind of standards that he brings there. And then I've also written uh, with another growing strength coach three um, editions there in issue 6.4, 7.1, and 7.2. So you can check those out. Uh, the International Youth Conditioning Association, or IYCA, is a really great resource. This one's free. They have some stuff that you can pay for on their site, but they at least have a great blog, which is a lot of ideas for youth strength and conditioning training. So 
a lot of different coaches contribute to that. Um, a lot of different methods there, different ways to engage with the material. Um, and then of course, experience. So uh, one of my first jobs out of college was strength training for a group of six to 12 year old field sport players. So mostly soccer and lacrosse, but in the gym. Uh, and that was some of the hardest that I've ever worked as a coach, because as, as the, those of you who have coached youths know, like that level of engagement, keeping things fun, there's no room for fluff. If something doesn't work, you're going to hear about it. And uh, so I, I think that, you know, with, with all of these materials, we tried to put together these big three points of uh, the best available resources, practitioner experience or the coach experience, and then the contextual and environmental fit. So the ideas on the ADM page are ideas from the USOPC, from the literature that have also worked in, in experience. Um, and, and also then you have to take them and put them into, into the context of your environment, because what I recommend what's possible for me to do might not be what's possible for you to do. So everybody's got to figure this out. And I hope that the resources are helpful for you in terms of at least laying all that information out there. And we can work through stuff like this webinar on how to make that fit for you. This is just for a review for anybody who did not attend to the first talk, our nonlinear rowified ADM pathway that represents how athletes can move through our different stages on different timelines, depending on, again, their motivation, their chronological age, their developmental age, and their training experience. Um, these are the big key points. And from a strength training perspective, I've sort of put my main headlines on the right side of the screen here. So with stage one, we're going to talk about the athletic motor skill competencies. And the idea of this is basically just physical education for the stage. We're not trying to train any U12 athletes to succeed in competitions. This is all about building uh, for the, the next level and future performance. Stage two includes both uh, middle school rowers who want to go into competitive high school programs, as well as the high school community or recreational junior program. So with this stage, both of those athlete pools, it's again, not about getting into rowing performance enhancement, but it's about the beginning this lifelong passion of physical fitness, teaching them fundamental movements, giving them this fun, engaging, athletically diverse initial training experience for the athletes who do continue into the competitive pathway, that foundation is going to really reward their ability to train and compete later on. For the athletes who stay in more of the recreational pathway, we still want them to be able to row for life, be fit for life, and enjoy physical fitness. So that's the purpose of strength training for stage two. In stage three, what we're really looking at is athletes increase their training to prepare for uh, more, more competitive performance and then high performance in stage four is we're, we're using strength training a lot to fill gaps from rowing and erging. So as some of the other speakers have mentioned today, you could be really good at rowing and, and really not be much of an athlete outside of the boat. Strength training provides an option to, to uh, kind of an antidote for that, to, to do that differently. We can train side to side movements, we can train rotational movements in different directions, which scholars or people who use the erg or sweep rowers are, are not getting, we can also use uh, di different exercises, to challenge different parts of the body, different ranges of motion and, and different types of loading, whereas in the stroke, it's pretty much the same every time you do it from stage one to stage five. So Strength training is both about filling the gaps from rowing and erging, so we don't develop muscular imbalances. This reduces risk of injury. And then we also increase performance with training for specific factors. As we move into stage four, we really start to trim off a lot of that other stuff. And stage four is about maximizing performance and not doing more than necessary. Some of these competitive programs and, and some who I've talked to are doing the strength training that that doesn't matter for rowing performance. And I think that that becomes damaging when we're also talking about high load, uh, high volume rowing training too. So for strength training, we're looking at what do you need to perform your best? And then let's not do much more than that in the gym because you're also doing a ton of rowing and focusing on your rowing performance. And then in stage five, this is row for life, but it's also fit for life. So I want, if we do this right, we have athletes who have learned how to strength train 
who have developed this broad base of athleticism and physical fitness and an appreciation for physical health uh, and performance. And they're going to want to keep doing that even when they're not engaged with competitive sports for their own performance anymore. So that's the whole kind of cradle to grave youth to older adult model. And now we're going to go into each one of those stages with some specific key points. Stage one, not going to spend too much time here because it's not the focus of this conference. The big idea is that this sets up the stage for everything else. So if we had youths who comprehensively learned all of these skills and basic strength training, our ability to increase training and performance as high school and collegiate and beyond would be totally transformed. Um, the big things for youth are that there's no minimum age. So I've got this nice quote from one of the NSCA authors of the youth uh, strength conditioning statement um, that seven to 12 is an awesome time to start strength training. We're not doing heavy load barbell exercises uh, with, with that age group, but we're teaching movement fundamentals. And, and like Dr. Fagenbaum says, it could be so much fun that it never occurs to the kids that they're getting quote unquote strength training at all. The big things that we look for as far as minimum age goes is mental readiness. Can they follow directions? Can they exist in the training environment? But that's still on us as coaches to make that fun. So but I, I kind of, I, I hesitated before putting follow directions on there because I don't want it to be like, okay, go do this training plan for an older athlete who's going to focus and try to train hard. Because again, with this age group, the focus is still a lot of fun, physical education, general engagement, and, and has to be. So anytime I'm going to knock a U12 athlete for not paying attention, I've got to look at myself first and see, did I present an engaging practice plan that day? And, and usually in my experience, that's been on me more than it's been on them. Uh, as far as physical readiness goes, the whole injuries and growth plate factors thing is, is mostly a myth, except when adequate supervision, load, and technique are not managed. So if we have adequate supervision, which is about a one to 10 coach to athlete ratio, especially for this young group, um, and, and when we don't load them up, have them do super high reps and push past the point of technical degradation or technical failure, then we don't see injuries. We do see injuries and we can see major problems when those other three things are not managed. <clears throat> Here's a quick AMSC pro tip for people. And, and you're welcome to either think for yourself or put it in the chat if you think you have a good guess as far as what this, what this one piece of equipment is that is affordable, has a low storage requirement. Many athletes can do it simultaneously, trains endurance, cardio, and coordination, hits our AMSC skills, which I'm going to go into next, and is appropriate and effective for all stages. If there's one thing that I could have in more boathouses across the world, this would be it. I'm going to pop over the chat here to see. Your own body, body weight exercises. Hey, we got it here. Jump rope. 90s kids will know these uh, cheap PVC plastic ones. Uh, this is again, like one of the most versatile equipments in terms of you could do it single leg, you could do it bilateral, uh, it's training upper lower, it's training eye hand coordination to be able to synchronize the movements. We're getting jumping, landing, rebounding, uh, core bracing. Cause if you don't have the, the tightness here, then you're going to lose, uh, torso control. Actually, I didn't miss my AMSC slide. So sorry about that. But, but the jump rope is a highly versatile piece of equipment. And if there's one thing that you could buy for like four or five bucks per jump rope, it's highly useful. This is worth spending some time on because it sets up everything else. So again, if we had youths who came in with a solid grounding and all of these, how much easier would our jobs be as middle school, high school and, and collegiate coaches? So this is broad categories of skills for those doing strength training with U12 uh, rowers or other athletes. There are lots of different ways that you can train, gamify these skills, make it really fun. And again, I think that that's how when we get away from the fundamental movement categories of squat, hinge, push, pull that we're going to talk about later uh, with, with these, we're really talking broadly and, and it can be really fun. I loved in, in Manny Valentin's last talk, he had a, a turtle tag 
which basically had kids doing like 50 squats per game. Uh, but it was fun. So they didn't, they didn't notice it the way that they would have had they said, all right, we're going to go do 50 squats. As we move into stage two, we are, again, thinking physical fitness for life. So this is middle school and, and recreational or community junior programs, uh, not transfer to rowing performance. This is still about the AMSCs for younger or early stage two athletes. And then we're moving into fundamental movements. Like I just mentioned, the, the big four kind of training movements of squat, hinge, push, pull, and, and starting to train those for the later stage two athletes. With stage one athletes, we can use open gym as long as it's well supervised and as long as the equipment is age and developmentally appropriate. Um, but with stage two, we really can't. And if you've ever seen like a, a freshman and sophomore or middle school class of, of athletes free ranging in a weight room, um, it tends to be a lot of chatting and standing around or, or congregating around the leg press and, and avoiding doing squats and other barbell exercises or crazy bad technique. So we really need more structure than open gym. And here's kind of just a quick comparison between early stage two and late stage two, as far as what we're looking for from maybe the middle school or the early high school athlete who's pre-pubertal or early puberty, and then the high school athlete who is in puberty or post-puberty. But then again, we're looking at chronological age, developmental age, and also training experience. So if we have a late stage two athlete who is older and post-pubertal, but doesn't have strength training experience, guess where we have to start? Fundamental movements, movement, movement competency first, teaching the body weight exercises before we can start loading them. So we've got to think in these three things of, of both the age of the athlete, the developmental stage of the athlete, and also uh, how much strength training experience they have in particular. Uh, for the most part, what I'm looking for here is two to three times a week of full body strength training should be done in, can be done in as little as 30 minutes, including a warm up, and maybe as much as 60 minutes, but it's probably not going to be effective for much more than 60 minutes because the athletes are not developed enough to be able to adapt from that much training. So Keep it short, keep it sweet, keep it focused on fundamental movements, still use some of the AMSC style exercises. The circuits are okay when they're used in this higher variety, uh, more AMSC focused fundamental movements, uh, lower load kind of context. As athletes develop from early stage two to later stage two, they become not challenging enough and then what happens is people tend to just jack up the reps keep the exercises very much the same so that we're doing sets of 20 30 plus on on different exercises and that's not really an effective strength stimulus it's also not really an effective endurance stimulus because even a set of 30 body weight squats is not going to take you as long as a 2k so that that training is not going to really transfer um, and then we're not really building much strength with that anyway, because the load is so low. So I think that circuits are okay, as long as you use them appropriately and keep them challenging for the athlete, we've got to be careful that it doesn't just become really high rep, high load kind of pounding on the joints. And another overview here, as far as, uh, appropriate versus inappropriate strength training for the stage two athlete. This gets at a few things that I was just talking about with appropriate training is using variations of squat, hinge, push, pull, and other exercises. We're, we're going to generally stick within those fundamental movement patterns, use variety within that. We're not going to go all the other way with machine-based or bingo wheel, which is like, man, let's just pick a workout at random and do it, or overly repetitive. We're just like sticking with the same exercises all the time. Those are sort of the two most common errors that I see is that rather than, rather than use, say, one type of single leg squat, one type of double leg squat. Uh, maybe we use a paused squat instead of a continuous up and down squat. There's all ways to change that stimulus without going like jumping on BOSU balls kind of level of uh, out there or without just sticking with the same training all the time, which is not going to be engaging and is not going to actually stick with a stage two athlete. But again, we're trying to think building for the future. So we want that athlete to want to stick with strength training as a high school athlete or beyond, as well as in the rest of their life. One thing that I was thankful to my ADM co-author uh, DJ for is talking about this challenge of training movement competency first, rather than just saying, well, everybody's going to do 15 reps and 
if it degrades, then it, then it degrades. That's a really hard balance to find between making sure that the athlete is doing the exercise correctly and, and giving them enough coaching and cueing and attention to, to help that happen versus just saying like, well, okay, let's just go ahead and do, do these reps. The other way that this can go wrong is like too much constraint, too much structure, too much nagging on the athlete is going to kill their enthusiasm for it. So scaling exercises to be appropriate to the athlete is, is really important. Um, a, a classic example is like the push-up, where at, a lot of athletes are not strong enough to do a full from the ground body weight push-up yet. They can do an elevated push-up with the hands up on a plyo bench or a, a plyo box or a bench just fine, uh, but bring them down to the floor and it's just too much load. So start those athletes higher up. You'll make your job a lot easier because you don't have to spend so much time focusing on the technique and an, an exercise that is just too advanced for the athlete. So try to try to regress the exercise variation to match the athlete's readiness. And that again, depends on training age, a lot of other factors too. Again, this is a non-linear pathway that we're working with. Stage two is probably the most, most complex or can go the most different directions. Our middle school athlete might go from early stage two and stay in stage two, go to late stage two as a, as a recreational junior rower. The middle school rower also might go into competitive junior or the, the train and compete stage three stage. And then it does happen where a recreational junior is maybe a late bloomer. It doesn't have the same opportunities or access as, as somebody in a more competitive program. And, but they still have the talent, the ability, even if they weren't recruited to walk on at the collegiate level. So you can go from stage two to either late stage three or straight to stage four in the collegiate and, and high performance side. Then you can also graduate from a recreational junior program. And part of this is we hope you're gonna to wanna to stay with rowing in row for life or fit for life stage five. So lots of different directions we can go there. Strength training can play a part of any of them. As we go into stage three, it becomes much more important that we're considering rowing training age as separate from strength training age. So your, your fastest, most talented rower might not also be your strongest, most talented, most coordinated lifter. If they don't have the training experience, they often will not have the ability uh, commensurate with their rowing performance. So if they, started, if they started rowing as a middle schooler, but didn't get any strength training, they can be very good at rowing. And again, not very good at, at anything on land. So we got to think about those as different factors. Um, <clears throat> we're going to come back to fundamental movements for, for this age group. And the, I've got windows of strength and muscle development. It's never going to be this easy again to build strength and muscle mass. So make the most of that by providing time for strength training and that athlete's life and rowing performance is going to be a whole lot easier for them as they go to the next stage. In this stage, we also start training specific physical qualities for rowing. So again, we're thinking train and compete. So we are starting to build toward performance specific training for uh, the, the highly talented junior or, or senior. Same as stage two, quick comparison here for early stage three, freshman, sophomore athlete, uh, either going through puberty or just gone through puberty, late stage three athlete is going to be in, in junior or senior year and, and post puberty or late puberty. Usually the strength training experience is going to go together there, although it might not. So we've got to consider that as separate factors with the early stage three athlete. We're really looking at like stage two again. So we're using the AMSCs building up to the fundamental movements. Whereas in stage three, we're really focusing on taking the fundamental movements further. So we're going to the next level there with uh, starting to focus on improving performance and using a more conventional strength training model. So circuits could be okay, as long as they're still challenging for the early stage three athlete, uh, but they're really not gonna be sufficient for the junior senior uh, rower who has that experience already from middle school or first or sophomore year. So I think at, at that point, we've got to start looking to the weight room to provide sufficient loading for them. Otherwise, our only choice is to jack up the complexity of the exercise and they start doing basically gymnastics 
um, or they start doing just super high reps, which again, is not going to be an adequate strength stimulus. We can get overuse injuries from that. And it's not particularly effective for improving rowing performance in the modern era. Here's a slide with a lot going on. Demonstrating how we can progress in both movement complexity as well as loading. So you can think that at the top here with the basic first tier of exercises, we're going to be really starting with our fundamental movements and our early stage three athlete who's just getting the stuff down. Then they can go to the next level where the exercises get a little bit harder. In the next level, they get a little bit harder again. Same thing with the next. And then really at this top level is, you know, this is about as, as advanced as I would expect an athlete to be in terms of uh, strength training exercise selection. For a quick lingo breakdown, DB is dumbbell, kettlebell is kettlebell, or sorry, KB is kettlebell, and BB is barbell. The one that's odd is down here. HB is hex bar. I don't know if you've ever seen that or a trap bar where the bar goes around the, the center of mass of the athlete and has parallel handles on the side. That is my favorite deadlift for rowers. And that's another thing that if you have boathouse strength training equipment, and you're looking to add to that. That's what I would highly recommend. Then we can either move up in movement complexity. We can also increase here on the bottom in terms of how we load those exercises and how we train those exercises. So we're going to start out with the athletes doing unloaded exercises, reps under 20, so we can keep movement quality high. We're not trying to train into super high rep, uh, what I call like fake endurance that doesn't really transfer to rowing performance and isn't a good strength stimulus. Uh, but we are trying to get enough practice opportunities in for the athletes to be able to develop those fundamental movement skills. Once that isn't challenging anymore, then we can start to move up into lightly loaded exercises. I would love to see uh, for example, male athletes be able to do 20 push-ups before we start doing stuff like dumbbell or barbell loading. Uh, for female athletes, depending on how they're built, we might use an elevated push-up or we might go, uh, you know, 10 push-ups from the ground before we need to start thinking about adding loading. We can get a lot of progression in the meantime, just by working different push-up variations, uh, different, different tempos and, and different rep ranges. And then as we get into the more advanced late stage three or early stage four athlete, we're going to need uh, to use either percent one RM or rate of perceived exertion or RPE loading, where we have, you know, a scale of one to 10, 10 being hardest, absolute maximal, maximal, no more reps or weight able to, to add within that set. Uh, and we could do strength training, you know, RPE nine, which would be you could do one more rep or add a small amount of weight and so on. Um, and, and there we're looking at long-term progression too. So we're looking from one season to another. How do we build up through the different strength training approaches? Uh, there we're basically talking about periodization, how we schedule training, and we're into sort of like programming and more advanced concepts at that stage. For these earlier stages of unloaded and lightly loaded Strength training, we're just sort of doing it to, to get the exercises down to build up that early movement competency. And then here's a couple uh, example sessions for how we'd manipulate all of those different factors into these three different workout banks. So these are just example workouts. This is not like a program. This is just to show how we can take uh, a circuit approach, A1, A2, A3, for example, or a circuit, and then you take one to two minutes of rest and do that again. So we can use circuits, but still have them be shorter, more focused on strength development, not going into that blurred aerobic endurance slash strength sort of dead zone. And how we manipulate both load of the exercise as well as complexity of the exercise. And I've got my presentation slides uploaded in the SCHEDGE website, so you can download that. I've got my contact information at the end too if you have questions. So my hope was to be able to curve go through this at a broad level, have time afterwards for Q&A, and then leave you with a lot of resources to continue to guide your strength training for rowers. Stage three can go next to stage four or stage five. Uh, sorry, just looking here, RFESS, rear foot elevated split squat. Sorry, acronyms. Uh, so that's, that's gonna be a, a squat with a leg back on a bench or, or a plyo box. <clears throat> going to keep going here and then I'll come back for Q&A. Uh, 
just the interest of, of making sure to do the time. So uh, stage three can go to stage four or five next. Our competitor junior might move into stage four after age 17 as a national level rower, as a collegiate recruit. We also might wait on that, go through senior year, move into stage four as a collegiate rower. Uh, a collegiate walk-on might take our first year to do the training compete stage basically for rowing and then and then move into stage four as a collegiate varsity rower. And then our junior also might graduate and go into row for life at stage five. Stage four, also I'm gonna go through relatively quickly. Um, it's the most nuanced stage and we're always gonna come back to these two ideas of periodization and individualization. So by the time an athlete is sufficiently advanced both developmentally as well as experientially so they have enough rowing training and strength training experience to be at stage four focusing on performance and excelling they're they're too good to be able to maximize all of their physical qualities at the same time so we can't maintain year-round uh maximum endurance maximum anaerobic fitness maximum peak power, maximum strength, maximum muscle mass, all these different factors that we need to perform as rowers, we get a relatively short window to peak all of those skills. So we can't do the same strength training program year round, just the same way we can't do the same rowing training program year round without burning out the athlete or leaving performance on the table by, by failing to maximize those qualities. We're also looking at individualization a lot. So I'm presenting all of these broad principles here as though we're going cleanly from stage one to stage two, stage two to stage three, stage three to stage four. The reality is that in rowing in the US, we don't have that kind of pathway, especially not where strength training is concerned. So this is where we're working towards. But for right now, we've really got to be thinking individualization of what kind of a training experience does the stage four athlete have and what gaps do they have that we need to fill? So what, what do they have? Where are they strong? And where are they weak? What do they need? And that's how we're gonna be thinking about training for the stage four athlete. Uh, and then maximizing performance has as much to do with reducing injuries and keeping athletes healthy and making sure that they have time in the boat and can go hard during their practice opportunities. It doesn't really matter how strong fit or fast or technical you are if you're too hurt to be able to perform on race day. So reducing injuries is two sides of the same coin with maximizing performance. And I'm excited to hear uh, Dr. Lisa Lowe's talk tomorrow in the, in the prehab for rowers about how to keep rowers happy and healthy. So tune in there to hear more. <clears throat> A couple of the key points for stage four is like I mentioned, we're doing what you need to do to perform and not more. So we're not doing kind of for fun strength training at this stage because it takes away from your rowing training side. And if you want to do CrossFit or something else like that, that's great, but that needs to be carefully managed in your overall training here because otherwise it's going too many different directions to, to be able to focus on maximizing rowing performance. I often say that you can spend the rest of your life doing strength training, you've got a relatively narrow window to be able to enjoy high performance collegiate or post-collegiate rowing. So make the most of that. I think strength training is awesome. I think strength training is a lot of fun. I'm a strength coach because of those reasons. Save that for later because you could do that all the time. Um, and then, like I said, individualization, a key point that, or a question that often comes up is where's the point of diminishing returns? or when is a rower strong enough to be basically done with strength training and focus on the rowing side. And that theoretical point definitely exists, but in practice, I think it's a lot harder to determine and it's gonna come back to periodization and individualization. So you might be, you, an individual, might be strong enough to where you don't need to do maximal strength work during your race prep rowing time but we are gonna go back to that work in some way to at least maintain it during the off season time. So there we're talking about periodization, off season, in season. We might add a third layer of preseason. Uh, we can get more specific from there, but the basic idea is that when we're not pursuing rowing goals through race prep, we have more room to do strength training so we can build muscle, we can improve muscular balance. There's all these other reasons to do strength training besides just what's your one rep max. Uh, and so I think that, again, that, that point of diminishing returns as far as maximal strength and power does exist, but it needs the context of who is the athlete, 
when are they in their overall training, both development uh, as far as their career, as well as in their individual season. And then we answer the question of what kind of training is appropriate when and in what amounts. <clears throat> One of the things that I'm excited for the ADM page to have is uh, kind of co collections of white papers or position statements that summarize available research into easy to break down manner. I've done one of these already for the return to train phase. And I highlight this in the presentation. It's important for especially stage three and stage four, but everybody should think about it in general, is the, the largest risk for running injury is sudden changes. So when we, when we either return to routine training after a one week break away, so that could be due to illness or injury or vacation, uh, final exam schedule, change in the quarters or semesters, whatever. If we come back to training, we need to make an adjustment in intensity and or volume. This also applies when we change modes. So in rowing, we change really quickly between fall head race season and for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, winter erging time. We know that erging is very biomechanically different from on water rowing. The loads on the athlete's body are different and the injury risks are different. We make that change quickly again when we transition from erging in the winter to rowing in the spring. Uh, those who do training camps, we suddenly increase the volume and the frequency of, of the training. We need to be able to adjust the intensity of the training to, to uh, accommodate that. So I've got a quote on here for the comparison of what is done with what is prepared for. So what, what are we doing with the athlete and how have they prepared for that? If the answer is, well, they haven't, then we're probably going to see increased injuries there. And so that, that's why this is the most sensitive phase for injuries. And if you want to keep athletes healthy, have a progressive, gradual plan to return them from times away from one training mode to times in a new training mode, whether that's a break away from training into routine training, or whether that's switching between rowing and erging or erging and rowing. There's a lot more information there on that webpage if you're interested. In stage five, like I said, it could be master's rowing for you, or it could be uh, coaching, mentoring, officiating, working within club management. Personal fitness and healthy physical activity should still be a part of your life. So I sort of think of this as the, did we do a good job phase? And I mentioned in the earlier talk that it hurts me when I hear from former teammates of mine and former athletes of like, yeah, I was competitive, I went hard. And now I'm basically sedentary because they burned out on training. Uh, they hate erging. The, their physical fitness motivations come from bad places of anxiety and, and forcing performance, um, or they didn't learn how to actually strength train themselves. Uh, I've, I've talked with athletes who just showed up and did training sessions the whole time in college. And then when they graduated, realized that they didn't know how to lift that when it came time to actually go into a gym themselves and do something, they didn't know what to do. <clears throat> Athlete transitioning is also something that I think needs more attention. This is the term in sports psych used for when athletes transition out of competitive sport to something else. So uh, retirement is also an idea. Uh, there's, there's a few different terms that are used for this, but it, it, it involves a loss of identity. Probably most people on this webinar have gone through this in some way. If you've gone from your own sport experience to coaching, you've gone through an athlete, a, a transition to something else. Um, but by, I think by staying in rowing, by staying in coaching and sports, you've, you've found that new community. And that's the biggest thing with athlete transitioning is you go from being an athlete for a significant amount of your life. All of your daily routines revolve around this. Your social circle probably revolves around this. Your idea of who you are is as an athlete. Those are all things that are performance enhancing, helpful for you when you're an athlete. But when you're not an athlete anymore, what do you do? And finding new community is one of the biggest challenges with that. Uh, the AASP or Association, uh, American Association of Sports Psychology offers sports psych counseling specific to athlete transitioning. And... There are a lot of other resources available on that too. The NCAA has a good page um, on, on resourcing kind of like what to expect. What research on athletes shows is that the more that we talk about this, the more that we feel prepared to go through that transition, everybody has to retire eventually. 
even if it is from one kind of training to, to another kind of training, um, the, the more prepared we are for that, the better the outcomes are. So I think it's something we have to start talking about for me with strength training. It's an opportunity to say, this is something that you could do for your whole life. Even when you don't have an eight of rowers or, or access to a boathouse anymore. Um, and it's also an area where coaches have a huge advantage. So I've got a quote from, from one of the research pieces on athlete transitioning that retired athletes who did not have a good relationship with their coach expressed more difficulties socio psychologically, uh, during the transition process from competitive athlete to the next thing. So, so by being empathetic and caring and communicative coaches, we are helping athletes in the next phase of their life too which fits in this big ADM uh, youth to older adult model. All right, and that's the base of my presentation. There's where you can find more from me. One thing that I have on my YouTube is uh, videos from the Olympic Development Program camp that I provided for last summer. Um, so that, that goes through some of those exercise banks of all the, of all the different exercises and how you can move from from least advanced to most advanced. I've got one video for all the squats, one video for all the hinges. So you can go you can go there and find that if you were confused on some of the terminology from the strength training side. All right, I'll come out of share now and check into the Q&A. Feel free to put in the rest of your questions and we've got a little over 15 minutes. Okay, first one here is uh, coaching novices and they don't need to do heavy loading yet. Yep, correct. So our strength training is typically movement patterns with a bar. Any suggestions for how I can make it more fun? Um, yeah, I think look outside the bar. So the bar is great for some stuff. Um, it definitely provides a sense of tactile feedback and a bit of, of more loading, but go into those AMSCs. Uh, so, so check back to that slide and go to the strength training pages uh, on the ADM and we have resources for more ways that you can use those rotational upper to lower components, uh, single leg exercises, single arm exercises are really helpful. So I, I think use some more variety and, and teach athletes how to do more than maybe just those, those basic exercises. That's gonna pay off in terms of engagement as well as in terms of their uh, overall development. Next one here, freshman novice on a competitive team with no experience rowing or strength. Is that what stage two or three? Good question. Uh, if you if you weren't in our first ADM talk, check back to the replays when those were available. And um, we had a nice diagram on there for a, a Venn diagram of stage two on one side and stage three on the other side. There is overlap. This is a this is a overlapping age model for ex exactly this reason that most athletes are coming into rowing at the high school level they might not that might be their first athletic experience of any kind so they're not going to go straight to train and compete they would probably be in stage two and then assuming they go beyond the novice year that's when they would move into stage three How do we balance strength training two to three times a week with the importance of longer, lower intensity cardio? Yeah, uh, we have a limited amount of time and cannot count on them to do workouts on our own. How to fit all the training in is the, the biggest, most consistent question in, in all of rowing training. Um, it, it is very challenging and, and it, it kind of is regardless of who you are. So uh, even, even if you're running with a resident athlete program, high, high performance, you're still dealing with more rowing training to then balance out with the strength training. Uh, and athletes often have um, other, other, other life responsibilities too that we've got to factor in. So I think that one way you can do that is uh, depending on who your athletes are, what kind of, what kind of rowing program you're working with. Um, if you're in stage two, you can work those basic 30 minute sections into your rowing training. If that's a day when you're blown off the water due to, due to weather conditions, uh, or, or if you just set aside, Hey, we're going to do a shorter high intensity workout. That's going to be shorter duration, right? If we're, if we're going into, into short high intensity interval training, uh, that'd be from the morning presentation, Dr. Steven Seiler's, uh, red bucket kind of workouts. That might be a good time to do 
that and then take a rest and then 30 minutes of strength training after that. Um, I also think that the full body warm up is a great opportunity for building in some of these basic movement skills. We're not going to be getting in much work during that time, but by including just 10 to 12 different movements from squat, hinge, push, pull, uh, shoulder, hip, core, we can still teach those basic movements and get athletes at least an introduction to those without having to think about it as quote unquote strength training with sets and reps and, and specific forms of loading to look for performance. So I think if that's the best that you could do, then that's a great starting point. And then we can build on that later on, either for the individual athlete or, or for your program, if you can, if you can add to that. <clears throat> okay, this is a, this is a similar question uh, about the potential interference effect of work and develop a strong aerobic base with long, low steady state workouts, plus strength training. Um, how do you mesh the two? Ideally, you mesh the two by not meshing them, by separating them, right? If we do one in the AM and one in the PM, we don't really see any interference between those. And especially not at the, at the lower, you know, sub, sub stage four levels. <clears throat> um, if we can't separate them, then what the research on the concurrent training interference effect shows is that it's better to do the lifting first and then the low intensity cardio second, especially when you can use heart rate or rate of perceived exertion or something other than split to determine your, your steady state intensity. So the problem is if we go do strength training and we fatigue the legs, core, trunk, and shoulder muscles, and then we say, okay, now go hold a two minute split for 40 minutes. Like that two minute split is going to be proportionally much harder than if we hadn't just done all that work. But if you can use heart rate, the heart's working the same, whether you're at a two minute or a 205 or, or a 150. Um, so as long as you're at the same heart rate zone, then, then you're doing well for the, for the adjustment that way. So I think those are, those are the best two strategies. If neither of those work, then, then let me know. We'll go to the next tier. If you're lifting once a week for teens, can we do maxes? Next question is also, do you recommend max lifts for juniors? Uh, I really don't. I think that the, my, my RPE scale stops at technical failure. So we're thinking about if we say RPE 10, RPE 10 is the point at which no more reps or weight is possible with good technique. So we want to stop before we go into technical breakdown, just get the weight up any way you can kind of kind of movement because that's not going to carry over to rowing performance anyway grinding out a max lift from a, a bad physical position and it also exposes the athlete to to increased risk of injury uh the other problem is that the only way to get stronger at that point is by getting worse once you give the athlete the idea that you can just round back a deadlift up to get another another few pounds or another rep out of it that's what you're going to do every time because then you've said okay i can do this so I need to do that again next time. Rowers are really good at locking onto a target and achieving that target. So for strength training, we've got to know that and, and kind of set up some things to, to keep rowers out of that zone. So I think that'd be better, you know, if you only have gym access once a week, stick to more of the RP seven to eight rep range, do some more volume, five sets of five, four sets of eight is, is going to be more productive for their overall growth. And then fit in some of those shorter uh, 20 to 30 minute um, lower load kind of that that's where the circuit training can be really valuable to, to train different movements, different planes of movement, get rotational, get side to side uh, and, and train different muscles that aren't that aren't just the rowing muscles. And then when they can when they can do more training later, then that's the point where they can start working into higher percentages or higher rates of perceived exertion. Good question here. Definitely a challenge of rowing is if you're coaching athletes of different levels of varsity slash JV in one practice or at the same time, how do you differentiate? Do you do the same circuit with different levels of movement, give them a choice of which one works best for them. Even at year two, there are different levels of competency. Absolutely. I think either of those options are really good ideas. So using 
the same movements with different uh, different targets. So either either different reps or different loads or scale the exercises or let them self-select because what's challenging for one athlete, like you might be really good at squatting, but really bad at push-ups. So you can maybe do something more advanced for the squat and less advanced for the push-up. Um, one thing that I like is to use time bound circuits rather than rep bound circuits. So instead of saying, Hey, you're going to do 20 squats and then move to the next station, say, we're going to do squats for 30 seconds and then move to the next station. And that lets the athlete who's less advanced or less strong do fewer reps and really focus on getting the movement quality down. They might get eight to 12 reps. And then the athlete who's stronger can do more reps or do more load within that same amount of time. How do we balance erg training and lifting without putting athletes on risk of injury? Another good question. If you're strength training with a lot of the principles that I've discussed in this, risk of injury should be pretty low. Where I see risk of injury get higher is where we start pushing into high volume strength training. So we're doing a lot of work, a, a lot of to total sets and reps. Uh, we're using exercises that are more advanced and then the athletes can control and or we're pushing past the point of technical success and into technical failure or movement breakdown. Uh, hard strength training within reasonable volume bounds is, is, is pretty low risk in terms of injury. Um, there are definitely different lifts that you can do that are going to be more tolerable for athletes than others. And strength training and reducing injuries, again, both work together to improve performance. So I think that strength training is injury protective in the sense of we're improving the athlete's muscular capacity to keep load off of the skeleton and onto the muscles when they're erging or rowing, and that's helping injury risk, but only if they're strength training well. So if they're doing round back deadlifts, if they're doing squats, and the knees are folding together, uh, if they're doing rows and they're using a ton of torso movement, uh, none of that's really building their ability to move well on water and keep load off of the skeletal structures. So... I think that it, it, there's balancing erg training and lifting from a volume approach, but think first from a movement competency approach and from a using appropriately strength training for that athlete's level. I think one thing that I, that I avoid doing is doing erging and then strength training because athletes tend to tend to stay more fixed on like, how hard can I push myself in strength training? So if we have to do those two together, I would rather do the strength training, take a short break, and then do the erging after that. And that actually ties into another question that I'm just seeing on here. If I'm splitting a two hour practice into half, half on the weight room, half on the erg, should I do high intensity on the erg and a lift or steady state and a lift? And, and I'd rather do the lift first, take a short break, and then do the steady state based on heart rate or rate of perceived exertion. So uh, Dr. Seiler had some good tips as far as like how to stay below your ventilatory threshold, make sure that athletes can talk to each other. That's a good sign that, that you're doing aerobic steady state. Uh, I've heard him talk to that, that he doesn't use the talk test for himself when he's training on his own. He uses the sing test. So you can have athletes sing, uh, you know, whatever song is going to, is going to work for them. And if they can, if they can sing, not necessarily tonally, but at least have the, the ventilatory power for it, uh, then, then they should be in a good aerobic training zone and not pushing too hard. <clears throat> Usually we only do strength training during the winter season. Should rowers continue to do it during seasons when they're on the water and rowing competitively? Yes. If you stop strength training at the start of your season, you're the strongest at the start of the season when it matters the least. And then you're the weakest at the end of the season when it matters the most, right? That's when the championship races are. So if we can have some sort of maintenance plan, maybe it's not the same Maybe it's not the same frequency or the same volume or the same intensity, but some sort of maintenance plan to help athletes maintain the strength that they built in the off season until the end of the season. That's how we can one improve performance and two build one season on the next so that the athletes getting stronger season after season and year after year. Uh, if we're always sort of doing this one step forward, one step back thing, then the athletes not actually getting that long-term development. So we, we want to have some one step forward, maintain it. One step forward, maintain it. More coming in the q and I've got three more minutes here. Uh, do you consider rowing itself partially a strength exercise? Yeah, more so than other endurance sports for sure. And Dr. Sally mentioned this this morning too, like it's more necessary for rowers because we deal with the external force of the water. If you're doing cycling, 
uh, and you have gearing or you're doing running or skiing and uh, you're not dealing with as much load as you are when you're rowing. I do consider it only partially a strength exercise because it's only one movement and it's only the concentric or the lifting phase when muscles are shortening under load. So if we only consider rowing partially strength training exercise for that, we're missing the benefits of eccentric loading or when muscles are lengthening to resist force or gravity. And we're also missing stuff in different planes and different movements than the horizontal squat pull motion that we have in rowing. So yes, partially, but not enough on its own. Following up on splitting, erging, and lifting, I have close to 40 athletes, so I split them into two groups. One group does one, then the other. Yeah, we don't have all room in the weight room once. Yeah, that's tough. Um, what I would do then is, let's say you have two sessions per week to work with, and the athletes flip one, one and then the other. So you'd have group A go first in the lifting on Monday, for example, and then group B go first in the lifting on Thursday, just again, for, for example here do different kinds of strength training in those two workouts. So when the group is going second, they're doing the erging first and then the strength training, do lower load, more AMSC movement focused strength training. And then when they're doing the strength training first, when they're fresh and not fatigued, that's when you do your higher intensity strength training. And again, we're always thinking like general principles, general concepts, some training is better than no training. So if we're thinking like, okay, we've got these structural constraints. How are we still going to get some amount of training in? Some is better than none. So good, good, good job thinking creatively and trying to find an answer instead of just saying, well, we've tried nothing and nothing is working. Thoughts on using ERG for power lifting type workouts, similar to what Ed McNeely and the Canadians, or at least said they did. Uh, I think it's okay, depending on the athlete and depending on the level of the athlete, I don't jack up the damper setting with uh, young athletes, developing athletes, or athletes who don't have enough experience to really maintain technique under that high load. High damper erging is definitely a risk of back and rib injuries. Um, so we've got to be careful about how we introduce that stimulus, making sure that the athlete is developmentally ready for it, as well as has the training experience and the coaching to, to manage that in the rest of the training program. Um, I, I don't, I don't do it just to do it. I do it for an athlete who has a specific need there and also the ability. And we skim through the chat just to see if I missed anything. <clears throat> uh, mobility, stability assessments to change an individual juniors strength training program. Yeah. The more, the more data that you have access to, uh, the more individualized you can make their training. So definitely tune in to Lisa's uh, PT talk tomorrow because that's going to go into some of these more mobility stability side. I really consider the job of the strength coach to take a healthy athlete and make them stronger, fitter, and more muscular, and then turn them over to the rowing coach to make them into a better rower. Uh, if, there's a, if there's a problem in there, if there's a mobility or stability restriction, and it's not something that I can solve just like that, then I refer that out to a physical therapist because they have doctoral degrees and a lot more experience specifically with this kind of nitty gritty troubleshooting. So if you have access to somebody like a PT comes into your program and helps run athletes through assessments that says these athletes need this, these athletes need that, then yeah, we can absolutely get more individualized with our strength training. All right, that's four o'clock. And just like that, I'm out of chat and Q&A. So uh, if anybody has questions, do please contact me. Email address strengthcoachwill at gmail.com. Otherwise, thanks a ton for being here. I hope you enjoy the rest of the ADM talks this weekend.